And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. What's the idea? Well, the idea is that the cosmos that God created had become corrupt. And that's a funny thing because, you know, this is the other thing about Genesis that always hits me is that that's also true. I told you that the Mesopotamians believed that human beings were made out of the blood of Kingu, who was the worst monster, monster that the dragon of chaos could imagine. That's a pretty harsh diagnosis. But, but the reason the Mesopotamians believed that is because they knew, as did the authors of Genesis, that human beings are the only creatures in the cosmos, let's say, the cosmos of being, who are actually capable of deceit, conscious deceit and malevolence. And the question is, to what degree does the expression of that conscious deceit and malevolence corrupt things so badly that it would be better that they didn't exist at all? Well, you see stories. There's a story associated with this in the Epic of Gilgamesh associated with the Flood that has exactly the same underlying narrative structure. In fact, some people think the story of Noah was derived from it, where the gods who created repented of their creation and determined that erasing it would be better than allowing it to propagate. And you see the same thing in the Mesopotamian creation myth, the Enuma Elish, because the early gods, so they're representatives of, of the giants of humanity, I would say, make so much noise and are so careless that the original creator god, Tiamat, and, and her consort, Tiamat, decides to wipe them from the face of the earth. And so, When you read something like this, if you read it from an informed historical perspective, it starts to have a depth that makes it, it transcend this sort of archaic and fairy tale like element of the story. It's like, I've read some very terrible things about what happened in Nazi Germany and, and, and what happened when the Japanese invaded China and, and just what happened generally in the history of mankind. And things can get so bad that it takes the imagination of a very bad person to conceptualize them. And when they get that bad, this is the only kind of language that works to describe them. You know, that's another thing that I've discovered working with my clinical clients is that when their lives are really not going well, you know, when they're close to suicide or when they're close to homicide, or when there are things going on in the family that are so corrupt and terrible that they reach back generations and they're aimed at nothing but misery and destruction. The only language that suffices has a religious tone. Because there's nothing else that's available to describe what's happening with the proper level of seriousness. And it might be that you've never encountered a situation that required that level of seriousness, but that doesn't mean that those situations don't exist. They exist. Uh, you generally do everything you can to avoid being ensconced in them, but they certainly do exist, and the probability that you'll encounter a situation like that or two at some point in your life is extraordinarily high. You'll tangle with someone who's malevolent right to the core, and maybe it'll be you that is, and that'll be a big shock. And then these sorts of things, these sorts of poetic descriptors start to become much more real. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. That's an interesting line, because if you remember back in the story of Adam and Eve, what happens to Adam once he eats the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and wakes up, the scales fall from his eyes, becomes self-conscious, develops the knowledge of good and evil, is he won't walk with God when God calls him in the garden. And so Noah is... Adam without the fall, essentially. And there's something that Noah's doing right that motivates God to spare him or maybe to show him a pathway through the emergent chaos, something like that. And that's worth thinking about a lot because there will be situations in your life where what you face is the emergent chaos. And maybe that'll be some terrible catastrophe inside your family, or maybe it'll be something that's occurring on a much broader social level, but the chaos is coming, 
And what you're going to want to know, unless you want to be a denizen of the chaos or even a contributor to it, and perhaps that is what you want, because many people under those circumstances choose that. What you want is to know how you build an ark and get through it. That's what you... If you're, if you're interested in life, if you're interested in proper being, and you're disinclined to produce any more suffering than necessary, then you want to know how to conduct yourself when the catastrophe comes, so that you have a reasonable possibility of, of moving through it and, and starting anew. So when, when this old story says, well, God's not happy and he's going to wipe everything out. It's like, well, you, you might want to take that seriously. And then when it says, but there's one person who had a mode of being that protected him from that, that's also something you might want to take seriously because you might want to know what that mode of being is because you might need to use it. And so these sorts of things are practical in the deepest possible sense. They're real in the deepest possible sense and practical in the deepest possible sense. So Noah walked with God. Now I'm going to switch way ahead here because you know the, I said at the beginning of the lecture series that the Bible is a hyperlinked text and everything refers to everything else and so there's utility in reading it in linear order but it's not a linear document it's a document that that you can move through in an infinite number of there's an infinite number of pathways that you can use to walk through it and all of the document expands upon and refers to all of the rest of the document. And so I'm going to switch to the Sermon on the Mount, which I think is probably the key document in the New Testament. And I'm going to switch to it because I think it's the closest thing we have to a fully articulated description of what it would mean to walk with God so that you're in the ark when the flood comes. It's the, it's the most fully articulated realization of that idea that, that leaps out of the metaphorical. Because if I say, well, you should conduct yourself like Noah and walk with God and build an ark, obviously those are poetic and metaphorical suggestions. And it's not that easy to bring them into practice, right? It's the distance. There's a big distance between you and the archetype. It isn't obvious how to manifest it in your own life. And, what has to happen is the archetype has to be differentiated and articulated so that it becomes sufficiently practical and personal so that you can actually implement it. So I'm going to take apart some of the Sermon on the Mount. It starts in Matthew 5, and I'm not going to talk about Matthew 5. I'm going to talk about the end of Matthew 6 and most of Matthew 7. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? Well, those are famous lines, and that's sort of Christ the hippie, right? It's like, hey, let it all hang out. That's an old phrase. Do your thing and everything will come to you. And these lines have been interpreted in that manner many times. But that's seriously not the proper interpretation. Because there's a kicker with this injunction. And the kicker is this. For your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. That's a lot different than the hippie thing, right? Because the, there's a very, very, very interesting idea here. It's, it's certainly one of the most profound ideas that I've ever encountered. Um, and the idea is this, is that if you configure your life so that what you are genuinely doing is aiming at the highest possible good, then the things that you need to, to survive and to thrive on a day-to-day -day basis will deliver themselves to you. That's a hypothesis. 
And it's not some simple hypothesis, right? Because it, what it basically says is, if you dare to do the most difficult thing that you can conceptualize, your life will work out better than it will if you do anything else. Well, how are you going to find out if that's true? Well, it's a Kierkegaardian leap of faith. There's no way you're going to find out whether or not that's true unless you do it. So, no, no one can tell you either, because just because it works for someone else, I mean, that's interesting and all that, but it's no proof that it'll work for you. You have to be all in in this game. And so the idea is, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. It's like, that's actually a fairly important caution when you're talking about not having to pay attention to what you're going to eat or what you're going to wear. It's like, what it's essentially saying is that those problems are trivial in comparison. And the probability is that if you manifest yourself properly in the world, that those things will come your way is extraordinarily high. And I believe, I believe that that's exactly right. I mean, I, I've, I've watched people operate in the world, and I would say that there is no more effective way of operating in the world than to conceptualize the highest good that you can and then strive to attain it. There's no more practical pathway to the kind of success that you could have if you actually knew what success was. And so that's what this, that's what this sermon is attempting to, to posit. It's like in, in the story of Pinocchio. You know, what happens at the beginning of the story of Pinocchio is that Geppetto wishes on a star. We talked about that a little bit. And so what Geppetto does is align himself with the metaphorical manifestation of the highest good he can conceptualize and say, he says, he, he, makes a, he makes a commitment, let's say, he aims at the star and for him the star is the possibility that he can take his creation, a puppet, right, whose strings are being pulled by unseen forces and have it transform into something that's autonomous and real. Well, that's a hell of an ambition. You know, and we're wise enough to put that in a children's movie, but too foolish to understand what it means. It's such an interesting juxtaposition that, that we can both know that and not know it at the same time. You can go to the movie, you can watch it, and it makes sense. But that doesn't mean that you can go home and think, well, I know what that meant. Well, people are complicated, right? We exist at different levels, and all the levels don't communicate with one another. But, but the movie is a hypothesis, and the hypothesis is... There's no better pathway to self-realization and the ennoblement of being than to posit the highest good that you can conceive of and commit yourself to it. And then you might also ask yourself, and this is definitely worth asking, is do you really have anything better to do? And if you don't, well, why would you do anything else? Therefore, take no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. I spent a long time trying to figure out what that meant, too, because it's another one of those lines that can easily be read as pro-grasshopper and anti-ant. You know, you remember the old fable of the grasshopper and the ant? Maybe not. I'm not going to tell it, but the ant works and the grasshopper fiddles and the ant has a pretty good time in the winter and the grasshopper dies. And so, this is like a pro-grasshopper line, but it's not because it says something else. It says that if you orient yourself properly and then pay attention to what you do every day, that works. And it, I actually think that that's in accordance with, with what we have come to understand about human perception because what happens is that the world shifts itself around your aim because you're, you're a creature that has an aim. You have to have an aim in order to do something. You're an aiming creature. You look at a point and you move towards it. It's built right into you. And so you have an aim. Well, let's say your aim is the highest possible aim. Well, then, so that sets up the world around you. It, it organizes all of your perceptions. It organizes what you see and you don't see. It organizes your emotions and your motivations. So you organize yourself around that aim. And then what happens is the day manifests itself as a set of challenges and problems and if you solve them properly then you stay on the pathway towards that aim and you can concentrate on the on the on the day and so that way you get to have your cake and eat it too because you can you can point into the distance the far distance and you can live in the day and it seems to me that that's 
That makes every moment of the day supercharged with meaning. That, that's how, because if everything that you're doing every day is related to the highest possible aim that you can conceptualize, well, that's the very definition of the meaning that would sustain you in your life. Well, and then the issue is, well, back to Noah. Well, all hell's about to break loose and chaos is coming. It's like when that's happening in your life, you might want to be doing something that you regard as truly worthwhile. Because that's what will keep you afloat when, when everything is flooded. And you don't want to wait until the flood comes to start doing that because if your ark's half built and you don't know how to captain it, the probability is very high that, that you'll drown. Take therefore no thought for the moral, but for the moral shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. That's not a particularly optimistic formulation. Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. It's a sensible piece of... It's a sensible description. I wouldn't call it a piece of advice because I don't think that any of this is advice. It's a description of the structure of reality. That's not the same as advice. And it basically says that you'll be held accountable by the rules of the game that you choose to play. And that, I also think, is perfectly in keeping with what we understand about human psychology. Because you, you, are playing, you have to play a game that other people will allow you to play and that will cooperate with you while you're playing and that will compete with you while you're playing it. But you have a fair bit of flexibility in setting up the parameters of the game. But you don't have any choice about whether or not you're going to be in a game. You're in a game. And you're going to be held accountable by the rules of the game because that's how the game works. And so you might want to pick a game by whose rules you would be willing to be held accountable.